everybody, it's Romania Black, and we are starting Fire Punch, the series by Tatsuki Fujimoto, who you may know from a series that just came out this last fall and kind of swept the entire anime world by storm, um, Chainsaw Man. <laughs> I, I have known about Chainsaw Man um, for the last few years. My brother is a huge manga fan of it. He told me I needed to watch it when it became an anime since he knows about my channel. And uh, I, before then, I wanted to read some of Fujimoto's one-shots because I heard they were really good and had a lot of recommendations for them. So I've read uh, Look Back, Good Night, or Goodbye, Airy, and then also um, Just Listen to the Song. I've seen those three one-shots. I know that Fujimoto is coming out with like various sets of one-shots um, in an anthology later this year. But starting Chainsaw Man, I had a lot of requests to read Fire Punch, which is the manga that Fujimoto completed before Chainsaw Man. So I was like, okay, it's eight volumes, eight weeks worth of reactions. What could go wrong? What could be, what could be more enticing than reading more Fujimoto? Because I'll be honest, it's been a couple weeks since Chainsaw Man ended and I'm feeling a little bit of a withdrawal <laughs> already. And I'm anime only for Chainsaw Man. So I know I have a lot of time to wait. So I thought, well, this will be a fun thing in February. It's the ultimate alliteration. It is Fujimoto's Fire Punch February, right? And March, because <laughs> we're gonna extend this on into March. Uh, March Madness, right? But I know nothing about this series at all. The only thing people have told me, and I like to go into these series blind, so I don't want to know anything. Um, the only thing I've been told is that it's um, it's pretty controversial. It's dark. I'm like, okay, that, that checks the boxes of Fujimoto right off the bat. I'm looking at the cover right now and there's an explicit content warning. Great way to start. Great way to start the reaction. So if you know nothing about the series, like me, please be advised, apparently there's some shit that goes down. So I don't know what it is. I don't want to know. As always with my reactions, I do not want to know any spoilers, hints, or clues of what might happen in the story. I want to go in blind. So hopefully, please keep that in consideration when you comment, if you comment. So, but yeah, I'm pretty excited. We're going to be doing one volume a week and talking about it. And I've, I've been excited for the last couple of months for this series and we're finally here. So what can't wait to see what's in store right so hopefully you all enjoy these reactions and discussions it's fujimoto so knowing what good of a storyteller fujimoto is and how they like to incorporate uh various like narrative devices and tropes and discussions and cinematic quality i'm really excited about this right i also think it's funny because in the one shot they did look back the protagonist had a thing called like shark kick right? Shark Kick was the fake manga that their protagonist made and here it's Fire Punch. So it seems almost like on the nose, right? So, but let's find out. I know nothing about this series. What it's about, I've not read the descriptions. I went on Viz Media, bought it and didn't read a thing about it because I wanted to be surprised. So I'm going to be reading this off the Viz site. I know you can buy these manga digitally, pretty much any retailer that you have, but I wanted to go directly to Viz because I do like their format and how they present them that you can react to. It's pretty fun. So yeah, so let's not waste any more time. I'm excited to start this series with you all. I hope you all are too. So we are going to start reading Fire Punch Volume 1 by Tatsuki Fujimoto. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one, let's go. Well, that was terrifying. <laughs> Oh my God, I, ooh, <laughs> this was volume one. This was volume one. Okay, all right, ah, I, okay. I do want to talk about this to an extent because I feel, I feel, man, I feel Fujimoto has learned the power of restraint <laughs> in the last five years, or at least in, since he's published this series and went to Chainsaw Man because man, if Chainsaw Man was an acquired taste for you, no, no, this is an acquired taste. And I'm even pushed to the point where I'm like, wow, we are, we are pushing the envelope. There's no way they could adapt this into an anime. I, mm, I, I don't think there's a possible, because I was wondering when I started this, when, when it was recommended I read this series, I'm like, well, this came out before Chainsaw Man. I know Fujimoto is a good writer and obviously his other one shots are really good. 
Why hasn't this been made into an anime? <laughs> no, I know now why. There, there's no earthly way that any animation studio would be like, oh, in the first chapter we have cannibalism and incest. Let's get this on the green light. <laughs> and the fact that cannibalism and incest is the tamest part of this volume says a lot, right? But but honestly, the cannibalism gets explained really well early on that, that it's not by choice. It is by choice, but it's purely for survival. There's nothing, I don't think if they were given the opportunity to choose between a meat, you know, like a, a soup made out of a cow versus their own flesh, I think that they would choose the cow. But the fact of the matter is that they're ma they've made a choice to survive and they're willing to go to whatever links to do so. And this is whatever links. So it's kind of fascinating, to be honest, up until point. But there, there are definitely, this is a dystopian world. And we find out the very last chapter with Togata that this is taking place hundreds of years in our own timeline in the future, right? That this ice witch has somehow covered the world in snow. Now, there's a lot of questions. I didn't bring Whiteboard Coon out for this discussion but I have a feeling as we go further the more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm like yeah we're probably gonna have to bring whiteboard coon out in the next volume to connect with whatever happens but god mm. so first off there is the question about the ice witch herself right is the ice witch a thing because this is taking place the Tagata says at the very end that they they watched movies up till 2020 to up until 2200 right and then after that movies were no longer a thing once the ice witch kind of came but a lot of time has passed since then so the question is is the ice witch an actual blessed being or is the ice witch one a natural occurrence like like the ice age like did global warming reach a peak and the ice witch is actually just a natural disaster that blanketed the world and kind of like a apocalyptic you know second ice age could be could it be like a result of like an apocalyptic like nuclear explosion or something that caused all the weather to go awry right could be that i i thought of honestly and again fujimoto is influenced by ano and neon genesis i thought of a neon genesis there's a it's a post-apocalyptic world and the disaster that happens in that story makes everything melt and become hotter and there's no longer seasons it's all just summer perpetual summer here it's the polar opposite everything because of this disaster of the ice witch everything is perpetual winter so it's the polar opposite effect <laughs> polar literally uh pun intended but I'm, I'm curious one if the ice witch is actually a thing they they call it the ice witch because then you can place blame on it right you can place blame on something much easier if it's personified right that's kind of a big point in this series too so far is that directing that anger towards a specific focal point rather than realizing that it's the result of several things leading up to it, right? Because even with Doma at the end there, it almost going back, it appears as if Doma's actions, it wasn't that Doma hated the village and hated Luna and Agni. It was that Doma was functioning under a certain set of parameters and then when they realized, oh, this is not going to work for us, we don't want cannibals, then that kind of, it wasn't that they specifically targeted the village to destroy. It's just like Doma's like, well, we can't use you. I'm going to put you out of your misery. Bye. And it just happened that Agni, it didn't work that way for him. <coughs> so there's that. But yeah, it, it's easy for Agni finding out like what literally fuels him is this revenge against Doma and then I, it shows him like, it shows him getting zapped at the end. But I'm like, was that, we're going to go through this. We got to go through this. We'll, we'll come back to Doma later on in this discussion. But I like the idea that's being proposed here that we give, we give blame to a personified focal point because it's easier to do it that way. It's more digestible to blame someone than to have to explain and try to comprehend the abstract idea that it's beyond our control, right? Because, you know, if you personify it and say it's one individual's fault, well, then that individual, it kind of translates over into Chainsaw Man. And I don't want to get into Chainsaw Man spoilers, but from the season we've seen, it kind of translates over into that. If we give something a, if we give something an identity that we can push blame upon, then it's easier to channel our anger and resources into stopping that thing 
than to accept the fact that something might be caused by a force outside of our control because humanity likes to be in control of its own destiny, right? So that's fascinating. I really like that angle and we don't know about the ice witch if it's even a thing. We may come out, we, it may find out, obviously I don't want spoilers moving forward for the series. Y'all can black box in the Discord and spoiler tag in the comments as much as you want. But I'm wondering if the ice witch will turn out to be even a thing. If they come to find out that no, the ice witch was never a person. It was never the cause of a blessed. It was just a natural disaster that we as a society gave a name to, to try to make ourselves feel better about and feel more in control over something that really we have no control over. So, but man, then the very first, the very first few chapters, we set up Agni and Luna as having regenerative powers that they can keep regenerating limbs. And Agni can do it instantly and Luna cannot. It takes her longer because she's weaker. And it almost seems like maybe it was, it almost seems like, I don't know if it was in inherited because they make the comment that their parents were used for fuel but their parents didn't regenerate, so it seems like that wasn't the case. But yeah, but just the idea of regeneration and that they feel it every time. They feel all of that pain, but they still live through it. It's like, oof. And, and the fact that the village, again, they end up in this village of all these old people. There's no one young there, and the old people are just determined to survive no matter what. And so if we got to eat the flesh of these kids... So be it, except for Vanna, he dies because he refuses to eat them. Mm. And so I, what Fujimoto does really well is set up emotional connections between characters. In the first few chapters, we set up just how, how close Luna and Agni are as siblings, that their parents have died and they're only trying to take care of each other and survive because their dad made the comment, you two have to live. That's what fuels me forward. But God, you could not paint a darker apocalypse than the one of Fire Punch. Like th this apocalyptic world, it's, it's very over the top in how grim it is. There are so far very few and far between nice people. And so far the nice people are, have very horrible ends. Like Luna, who seems rather, you know, nice. She, you know, basically gives up on life. She can't regenerate fast enough. Son, son, who I had all these high expectations for, he's going to be used as a fuel source and doesn't have any legs anymore. The fudge. I, oh, I want son's character to recur, but I'm afraid that son's character is like, like he can't walk. His legs are gone. So what do we do with that? Is his character just, you know, this sunny, kind-hearted, optimistic character is just doomed to become this country's fuel source? That was his purpose? Gah! Fujimoto, I, there is, there is like the, the optimist in me that, that tries to like push a little idealism over the realism. The optimist in me gets a little, you get a little discouraged reading the story because it's very dour and very, very, um, like kind of nihilistic a little bit being like, well, what's the point, right? Like see how terrible things are? Like, what's the point? No, no good thing is going to happen, right? It's very dire and depressing. And I have a feeling I have seven more volumes of this. And I'm like, mm, this is just going to be... Togata's role interests me, though. I'm curious to know what the hell she's going to do. So I, how she's going to play into this. Because she seems to want to, like, make a movie about Agni. And, like, make him into a legendary thing that people will remember. I, mm, it's crazy, right? But Agni remembers what times were like before the snow. Right? And it, it's established that they're probably in their teens. He's 15. So he's 15, so by the time that we cut to the present, eight years have passed, so he's 27 when we cut to the present, right? Okay. Or no, he's not 27. He cut through, he was 15, he's 23 when we cut to the present time. And his sister was probably around the same age, 14 or 15, right? And so, man, poor Agni, though, like having to deal with his sister, wanting to like have a kid with him, so that they can, like, you know, repopulate the area because there's just old people. Like, it's so bizarre. And there's, like, kind of this religious ritualistic part with this old village where they're like, you must resist death no matter what happens. And that kind of connects to what his father told them about living on and surviving and not giving up. It's kind of crazy. But there were all these pointers going back and relooking at this volume that showcase 
you know, what we could have expected, like the motorbike, the gun, like showing that this was a present timeline. Things just kind of went to a standstill once the ice, the ice switch came down, right? But this whole thing with Doma, where there are some things that it with Doma's character right off the bat. We have the soldiers like trying to look around for resources and young people to take back to Behemdorg with them. And they just find old people in the village. And Doma, right off the bat, he says, show proper respect and watch your language. Like from the, from the get-go, Doma's character is not really, he's so complicated because he's not really portrayed as like a total douchebag. He's like in that moment where he's like, you know, show your so show some language, show some respect and watch your language. He's like, we didn't come here to collect slaves. Like it doesn't make him seem like a bad guy, right? He seems like compared to the other soldiers who seem far worse, Doma seems pretty like pacifist almost. And then when Agni comes, he introduces himself to Agni and says that we've exhausted our supplies because there's a war going on. So we're here for rations and fuel. And so there's this big thing here where with Doma's character, Doma is not really acting any differently than Agni and the others. Agni and the others have resorted to cannibalism to survive, to gain resources to live. They're doing things that are not what they would culturally or morally accept normally, but to survive, they're willing to do them. Doma seems to be suggesting the same thing. He's like, hey, we're battling a war. We need supplies, nothing personal, but we got to survive and you all are the only means of us to do so. So sorry, got to do this. But he offers Agni being like, hey, you're strong. I'll invite you to live with us if you want to come. And the young, he's like, these old people are going to die real soon. So we don't care about them. Tough life. Um, but you can come live with us and soon we'll have enough manpower to take down the ice witch and return green to this world once more. But the funny thing is, he says that to Agni, but then eight years pass, and that's not come to fruition. So clearly there's something, either he was lying to Agni, or or something else, or they didn't, or something happened that halted that plan, right? And then Agni's like, I just want you to leave. We just live here, just leave us alone. We'll figure out what to do. We don't need you, right? But then once they find out they're cannibals, He's like, no, not having it, which is, which is kind of interesting that cannibalism is where we draw the line because the rest of this volume, like the whole soldiers of Doma, they're willing to like rape people and they're willing to like, like make kids drink piss and like do all this stuff like this. But cannibalism in, you know, a time where people are barely surviving, we can't have that. <laughs> I'm curious. And I'm curious why Doma gets so offended by it. If there's something to that. I, maybe we'll find out later, but he says, these things aren't people. My flames won't extinguish until their fuel has perished. It's interesting. He says, if that, if the king were here, we don't know anything about the king. If the king were here, he wouldn't allow a village of cannibals to go unchecked. And Agni's like, I don't understand. He's like, their fuel has to go out until my, he says, my flames won't extinguish until their fuel has perished. Oh, okay. He's like, I only use my power for the king. And the king would... So Doma makes a pretty broad assumption. Like I said, Doma's a fascinating character because on the outside, from the get-go, he doesn't seem like a terrible person. But then he makes these grand assumptions. Like he says the king would want these people dead. And I'm like, then how... Mm. But then he says... His flames won't extinguish until their fuel has perished. Meaning once I set fire to this village until everyone is dead, my fire will not go out. And Agni can't die. So the fire is going to keep going over and over again. And then God, it's just, it's just, it's a Holocaust. It's, it's awful. And then that's when he says, my flames won't extinguish until the fuel has perished. And Agni keeps coming back, but his regeneration keeps bringing him back over and over again. And so he prays to protect Luna from the flames. But then as he keeps regenerating, he says, so we established the idea that if you reject, if your mind focuses on negating the regeneration powers, then they no longer work. So if you're blessed by something, 
but and you negate the blessing, then it stops working. So theoretically, if sun wanted to stop being used for electricity, they just have to negate the blessing and then it will no longer work. I don't know if we'll ever get to that point. I don't even know if we'll see sun again. I don't want to know. But I'm like, oh God, sun's whole story is freakishly tragic. And so, yeah, Agni says, if I just died, I'd be with my family again. And that's when he sees his sister. And God, Fujimoto! Fujimoto, it's like, it's so horrific, right? Everything's shown with his sister. And he even imagines, like, what if we were just allowed... If he's like, well, our family could be together and I could show my sister all these things. He's like, or if we just, you know, he's like, I could have had, I could have had a life and a kid with my sister. You know, like she asked, would that have been so bad? And the kid almost looks like sun, which is sun and the moon, right? But then the moment that she says live to him and like fist bumps him and then dies, Oh my God. And that's what fuels him. He's like, she told me to live and I was consumed by the flames of anguish. And she was returned to ash. And so then he walks for eight years, regenerating over and over again. And so to distract himself from the pain, he bit off his tongue time and again. And then after like years, his body acclimates to the pain. I feel like it's it's very symbolic of if you just live in this state of constant pain and destruction, like eventually you just get desensitized to it. And eventually you are able to control how your body reacts to it. And that's absolutely horrifying, right? So, God. Mm -mm. And he finally teaches himself how to control the regenerative powers. So he was able to control exactly when he was going to regenerate up until the point when he attacked those soldiers. Like that was all. He was able to control it. And he makes this vow that he's going to kill Doma. Mm -hmm. That he's going to go back and find him and make him pay. And so then we go to the idea that, that Behemdorg, this place that has been that has been referred to by Doma as this paradise, you know, they're all, you know, working together to get rid of the ice, which is actually pretty shoddy. And the one guy that can turn himself into iron, he like makes the one kid like drink his pee. They're awful. They talk about how they're like going to sell the pretty people as slaves and like, just like use the others as livestock. It's disgusting. And then son is about to die and asks for someone to save him. And that's when Agni shows up. Like Agni looking like a superhero. Like he's built this body back up over and over again over the last eight years. Like he's just like ripped, you know. And he's not been living off of any food or anything. It's just this fuel of revenge that kept him going. And God, everybody else like, it's so cinematic. That big fire punch display. Oh my God. But like the one eye being kind of wonky and the other eye being like an ash, the flame covered man. And then we go back to his dad saying, you guys are what fuel me. And God, like all the situation of like his parents dying, what Agni and Luna go through leading up to them running away. Like it's just so disgusting and awful. And I'm like, Fujimoto, we get it. These kids have suffered. We, you, you definitely, definitely showed us. And so he asks, what fuels me? And it's his sister telling him to live. And so then son of all people, we meet son, this charismatic little ray of sunshine that is eight years old, joins Agni and believes Agni's his like God and has saved him and keeps following him. And we find out that he's blessed as well. He has this electricity, you know, this electricity power. And we cut to his backstory where he found out that the village he lived in was suffering from a plague. And they sent him away because everyone in the village was going to die except him. And they thought they didn't want him to see that because he was a kid. So it shows like his brother, Sugar, the things he likes, the priest, his granny Tua, Tania, his friends. He's like, they all sent me away. He's in a little burrito. And he says sugar. And I like the agony. The humor of this is so dark. The humor. The, there's very little humor in this volume. But the humor of it is so dark. Where Agni's like, you said sugar twice. And he's like, well, yes, I love sugar. 
He's like, what do you love? And I find it curious that Agni says meat and stew. He doesn't say his sister. He doesn't say that. It's curious. And the thing of it is, is that what fuels Agni and keeps him going is this strong desire for revenge and this hatred. That's what fuels him. And the moment he starts to like see Sun and think that there could be, you know, some warmth or compassion in him, his powers start to falter. And he says, if I'm not doing anything, the burning hurts. He's like, I need to constantly be in the state of wanting to kill and destroy things to keep myself going. And that's such a destructive perpetual cycle, but it's what Agni has been, you know, cornered into doing. And it's, you could make so many commentaries about it that, you know, people in war that do awful things, like that's what they're fueled by. And that's the only thing that keeps them going. Like there's lots of little commentaries you can make based off of this. If you really wanted to go there. And I feel like Fujimoto leaves it open ended enough that depending on, Depending on your circumstance, you can. Right? And so, again, we talk about scapegoating. Agni blames Doma for all this. He's like, he killed my sister. He's like, it's my fault I'm in pain. He did this to my body. He's like, no matter what, I'll kill him. Just him. But these other guys try to hurt him, and so he has to, you know, defend himself. And he, that poor son. Son is so clueless about what's going on. Well, she's an eight-year-old kid. What would he know? That Agni keeps, like, going through these men and it relieves his pain, destroying these men and saving Sun. <coughs> and then Sun says that he wants to live. And, and Agni tries to be like, oh, well, you can kill the kid, I don't care, and then kill me, whatever. And it's like, I, I, what I hate about this volume is that I thought Agni would stay with Sun. I thought that was going to be a thing. And it's not. So I don't know. I'm definitely going to read ahead. I'm sorry. I'm going to read ahead to at least volume two before this comes out on Patreon and YouTube. Because I want to know. I'm curious if if we're going to see Sun again. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Let me find out as I read. But I'm like, I, I want to know, right? He's like, please live for me. He's like, I'll kill him right now. And then he manages to save himself. And then there's this big avalanche. Now, Agni, of course, doesn't die. But he does look for Sun. Because Sun saying, live for me, reminded him of his sister. So he views Sun in, a, in that moment kind of like his sister and goes to look for him, right? And by coincidence, he manages to find Sun. And the village made this like prophetic saying to him saying that son would live for a reason, right? And they're like, don't tell him about the plague. He'll be the flame that shines on everyone purely by existing no matter where he is. He grows to live up in his name. That boy will bring warmth to this world. I'll live and warm up this world. And the disturbing thing is, yeah, he kind of is. Because that's the, that's the disturbing part is that, is that Sun is like, well, I'll live and bring warmth to this world. Well, technically, he kind of is by providing electricity to Bandorg. So by them, like, imprisoning him, he now doesn't have legs by, you know, disabling him and hooking him up as a generator for the city. Yeah, he kind of is living out what he said he was going to do. It's just freakishly disturbing how we've got there. So I'm like, I, oh, mm, Fujimoto. Fujimoto, sweetheart. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. And so at this point, we get to chapter, we get to the next chapter, which is chapter four, I guess. And what ends up, or chapter five, we get to chapter five. And Agni keeps walking and he keeps walking and Sun pees, but then Agni disappeared. Agni kept going and when he turns back, the kid's gone and he can't find him. And that's when Judah takes him. Now, Judah, the problem is that Judah looks like Luna, right? Judah looks like her, but, Ag but she's not. She's clearly not. She's someone else. To our knowledge, if she turns out to be Luna, 
But I don't think that's the case. She just happens to look like her, and Agni's kind of just disoriented and thinks that that looks like his sister. But they talk about fire, fireproof cloth, that it's not a hot commodity. They have to basically manufacture it and find it and procure it from another location. But we go to this camp where there's a greenhouse where they're cultivating things, and there's like a religion that's been developed. And basically, the woman, Judah, keeps having them shoot at Agni's head. And we cut to this cityscape where it's a literal city. There's like a church and everything. So so despite everything that's been happening, I'm assuming this is Behemdorg, despite everything, Behemdorg is still going on. It's still surviving. And now Sun is going to like sustain it. It's the most disturbing thing. And so all Agni can think about is his sister and how this woman kind of looks like her. But he's like, Luna died. And so then, God, the whole thing with Nanato, that whole plot point, what the fudge is this, Fujimoto? Like, they, the one guy, Jack, that we find out, thinks that Tagata and Sun are both girls, which they're not. Sun's a boy. But even... Even Nanato doesn't realize that he's a boy. She's 13 and doesn't realize it. So he must have a, like a really high-pitched voice. But him bringing in the dogs, like, it almost feels like Jack is almost like a psychologist. Like, he tries to psychologically break down their characters. And at first, at first glance, it seems like, okay, maybe this guy's okay. But this is Fire Punch, so that can't be. And at first, it's like, okay, maybe he's fine. And then the more he starts talking... And kind of says he wants to see what's inside people's hearts. And I'm kind of like, okay. And then he's like, oh, well, people who like dogs can't be bad, right? And I'm like, okay. And then he talks about how dogs are simple and straightforward. And humans on the inside are all the same. But on the outside, don't say stuff that's simple and straightforward. They put up barriers and guards around themselves. And he's like, I want to be frank. And he kind of psychologically breaks her down. Like, as as we got on to sing with Jack, even before the dogs got involved, I was like, oh, he's breaking down this Nanato girl where she's going to Stockholm Syndrome herself into wanting to stay there. And she does. By the end of her conversation, she, like, opens up to him. And she's like, I just want to stay here and do my job. Even though she just told Sun that they were likely going to get, like, sexually assaulted and used as, like, livestock, she ends up agreeing with it. I'm like, just that breakdown, right? And then we find out, though, that it was all an act. She, like, lured him in to get him to hug her. And then she's like, okay, zap him. But Sun, he's a dimwit. Despite having electricity powers, he's a dimwit. And doesn't get the signal. And kind of messes up, right? And so he tells him they're going to have sex with the dog. And Sun's like, I don't understand what that is. And then when he takes off his pants that's when the guy realizes that he's not a girl and so they run away and that's when apparently this guy's this guy jack ivan his older brother who has some kind of mental handicap it seems just cuts his legs off and he doesn't have regeneration powers like like agni so he doesn't have legs anymore and he's like, Ivan, but he lied to you, brother. And so he says that that the one boy's valuable. And he like just he just chucks like a punted baby. He just chucks son back at a uh, Jack and lands on him. And then just laughs about it. And Jack even says, Well, we don't need her, but killing is wrong. Like there, it's it's like that such self-righteous thing, like, okay, we're not gonna kill these people. But we're going to do even worse things than imaginable with them. And that's when, okay, he grabs, he like uses his power, Jack does. It says he's blessed. He uses his power and grabs onto the limbs of Sun and like makes them close up instantly. Ah, okay. That's why he cut off the bleeding. He can instantly like seal up a wound. So he kind of has like healing powers, Jack does. Okay. And because Ivan says it's a waste to use your blessing on a slave. And then he tells Sun that he's going to devote his life to Behemdorg, where they're at. 
He says, you're going to be restrained to provide them with electricity. That's the fate that God has bestowed upon you. The fate bestowed by our king. And Jack's and son says, my head hurts. And he's like, Mr. Agni. So I'm like, I want Agni to save him. I don't want him to just sit there his whole life and run electricity for the city. But, but I don't know if we're even going to see him again. So I'm like, hmm. And then apparently Judah knows Jack and Ivan. And says that Doma's outside. And so then Jack says, like a psychologist, I thought Doma had some kind of psychological illness and wasn't working with us anymore. So even Doma's not... He's not this strong character that the very first impression of him gives off. He's got some issues. Why did you say to get him to come out? Something he left behind. So apparently Doma's flames are noticeable or they've been, this situation has maybe happened before. And so then we see Doma and he's like eight years have passed and he has like, he has the Zeke look and like has his beard and his hair grown out. He's like, why do you have my flames? How are you still alive? And he's like, my blessing is that my flames won't extinguish until they've used up their fuel. Who are you? And he's like, you killed my sister. And then he's like, well, I didn't ask about that. But then he's like, did I really kill your sister? And he's like, I killed her. And he keeps asking that same question like, oh, I killed her. Oh, Will you ever forgive me? Like, he says, I'll do anything except die. What should I do? And I'm like, clearly Doma has some issues and I'm wanting to know more about them in the next volume. But I, and then, then Agni's like, well, I'm just going to kill you because I don't understand. Why, why would you ask me for forgiveness? Like, no. And it almost seemed like he's like, I'll do anything except die. What should I do? He's like, I just want to live. It almost seems like he was implying I want to live. And that's like Agni's trigger. So what? And then we get Tagata. And Tagata, it, it feels like a very one-shot Fujimoto vibe where he's just like, let's inject some. So let's just change things up as much as we can. And we find out Tagata is wanting to make this movie to like fuel her. She says, I'm not fueled by anything but movies. So I'm going to make my own. And I don't know if that's a big overarching an overarching commentary on the volume so far that Agni Agni really didn't know anything about Doma but he was putting ideas in his mind to fuel his own desire to to live and maybe that's an overarching meta commentary about the entire world at this point in the story that they just made up the thing about the eye switch to fuel them to keep going maybe it's all just a giant commentary layered upon commentary I'm assuming but man and then uh, the funny thing, again, again, there's like only two moments of humor in this entire story. One is the the twice sugar and one is they're like, oh, like, what, what are we going to call him? Like, I just, you know, it's like red snow, red dead fire, fire pa. Oh, I've got it. Fireman. And then we see Doma looking like Doma and we see like Agni crushed to bits. So, so did Agni die? What did Agni die? Is this a flashback of Doma first getting his powers? What? I have all the questions, all the questions and no answers yet. I, I definitely am going to have to read volume two before I'm going to have to read volume two before this comes out on Patreon for sure, because I don't want to be spoiled. I don't want any hints or clues. I, I can't. I've got to, I've got to read. I've got to know. I have to know answers now. I've started this stupid series. I have to know answers. But man, Fujimoto, Fujimoto, pun intended, pulling no punches, saying this is going to be the most messed up thing you've read. Hope you're ready. It is definitely the most the most dark thing I've read in a very long time. And we're in volume one. So who knows? Maybe it'll be like Game of Thrones where, you know, like the first couple volumes, things get a little dour, but then they kind of level off. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, but in any case, I, I'm going to be curious to know your thoughts down below. Please spoiler tag if you have spoilers.
But yeah, I'm rooting for Sun to get rescued, although he doesn't have legs anymore, so I don't know how that's going to work. But I feel bad if Sun's just going to be a, a battery for the rest of his life. But I, what do we do? So I'm curious to know your thoughts down below. I'm going to be excited to see where Tagata goes with this, how we do in this. But in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week, a much better week than the week of Fire Punch World. Um, stay safe, take care, and I'll be back very soon with more Fire Punch. Bye.